All right, this is John Cole with GrowingYourGreens.com. Today we have another exciting episode for you. And this is a super special, exciting episode for you guys because I've been waiting literally for years to do this episode at my friend's place. And this trip to Maui, I'm actually doing it for you guys. Uh, this is definitely going to be one amazing episode because my fr friend actually is an amazing person doing some really cool stuff. And what I'm going to show you guys in this episode is something that I aspire to. If I had 10 acres, you know, I would do very similar to this. Of course, I would do a little bit differently, but I would do very similar and model a lot of what I'm going to share with you guys in this episode. So the first thing I want to share with you guys is that, you know, we're in a area of Maui, um, in a, one of the valleys of Maui. It's a beautiful area. And uh, even in uh, this area of Maui, there's people with lawns, right? As you guys know, if you guys have been watching me for a while, I'm not a big fan of lawns. I mean, unless you have kids or you're grazing horses or something, I mean, it doesn't really do much for you, right? You could have your lawn, live in your house, but then you got to go to the supermarket to keep buying food each and every week or you're not going to be eaten, right? And I think this whole consumerism or consumption society that we live in definitely needs to change for things to get better. So, you know, the solution is actually what my friend is doing next door on his property, he simply has uh, 10 acres of land that he started this project 15 years ago. And there's a few peculiar things about my friend that's been able to make this work for him. And the very simple fact is that he lives off the grid. He eats 99.9% .9 of what he grows on his land. He does not go out and buy groceries. He eats his food fresh. You know, he gets spring water that's uh, onto the property. I mean, what else does a man need? Oh, and he's married too, so he's all set up in life. I mean, he's got a nice house that he built with his own hands uh, using uh, many materials found on property as well as many other sustainable and as sustainable as he could possibly make it. So, I mean, this is true sustainability in my sense of the word using the minimal amount of inputs, bringing the minimal kind of inputs into the land, but using what he has on the land to create fertility in the land and literally to grow his own food. Now he has been dialing this property in for the last 15 years. So I want you guys to be aware of that. I mean, this did not happen overnight. I've been visiting him now for about the last 10 years. My last trip here was three years ago. And between three years ago, and today, a lot of changes have taken place. It's like when I go on a vacation, you know, and leave my place for a week, I come back to my garden a week later and like, wow, things have grown so much. But when I'm literally here three years later, I'm like, wow, that's changed, that's different, that's different. It's always so cool to visit my friend's place. So anyways, let's go ahead and take you up to his 10 acres and uh, share with you guys what he's doing and how he's being, you know, pretty much for me, like ultimate in sustainability because he has basically everything he needs and he actually barely doesn't like to leave his house too much. So as you guys can see, we're standing in his driveway here and his driveway stops well short of the house up yonder. And uh, you know, I mean, the main thing here is that, think about it, if you don't have to go out and buy groceries and then bring them home and then cart them into your house like every day, every couple days, why does your driveway need to go to your house, right? It doesn't, because you're not bringing a lot of things in. You know, he doesn't bring a lot of things in to his property from off property, because literally he has everything he needs here. I mean, what more does man need if you got, you know, the fruits and vegetables to eat, good spring water to drink, nice weather, you know, uh, maybe a Mac computer, and of course, a nice uh, wife or lady to love. Nothing else. So yeah, so it, his driveway stops well short of his house. You know, just a couple years ago when I came here, he had a driveway up to his house because he was still in middle construction and bringing, you know, a few things in to finish up his house. But now that it's finished, his driveway ends short of the house and he has converted the area that was formerly a driveway into, guess what? Growing more fruit trees and plants that's edible and also useful. So I mean, Here's the thing, this is really weird. If I had to describe this place, like I couldn't say it's my friend's farm, that would not be accurate. If I said, oh, this is a, a permaculture 
fruit, fruit forest. Well, that's kind of right, because he uses some permaculture principles, but he doesn't do strict permaculture. If I said, you know, he's an old school plantsman, and you guys from the UK know what a plantsman is. I mean, that's somebody who really appreciates plants. That's more than a gardener and more than a farmer, right? I mean, you could, he, he has a fruit garden, no, that's not right. He has a fruit orchard, no, that's not right either. I mean, it's, it's all of these things, but none of these things, because what he has here, like he, how he likes to describe his place is, he simply calls it home. <laughs> And literally, that's what he's done here. He's designed all the systems here, planted all the fruit trees, the vegetable gardens, and all the ornamental plants here to his liking because it is his and his wife's home to make it pretty, to make it beautiful, to make it functional so that he could eat, live, and enjoy his time literally here in paradise. And so, you know, probably my best thing I could call it is like a permaculture fruit forest but that wouldn't even be accurate. I guess, you know, we'll let him just call it home. And, you know, and we all know the time that it takes us to make our homes nice, especially for some of the ladies out there watching this episode. You know, ladies, especially, because I have a bachelor pad still, but ladies like to make the home nice, hang up pictures, clean it regularly, and, you know, all the little things to make their home nice. Well, hey, if you're a guy, you're gonna make your home nice by doing the landscaping and making sure you're, you know, gonna be properly fed with fruit, trees, and be sustainable in case shit hits the fan one day and imports stop coming into Hawaii or whatever happens, right? He's literally self-sustainable here. He doesn't really need much else, right? And that's the real cool thing and the, the elements that I want to get across with you. And this is possible in many places, although we are here in Hawaii, the tropics, and I believe that people in general are tropical creatures. I mean, would we be able to live outside <laughs> in New York City in the winter without heaters and furnaces and all this kind of stuff? You know, I don't know, it'd be, it'd be not comfortable, but here in the tropics where I believe, you know, man originated and we'd like to live, literally we could live without clothes. <laughs> this is not a hippie commune, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, this is a real easy location to live, plus it gets plenty of rain and of course, lots of fresh air and things, let me tell you, grow beautifully here. So he's focused on uh, tropical fruits and he has over, I don't know, 300 different kinds of fruits. You know, not just 300 varieties, but he has different varieties as well as different species of fruits. Some are very rare, unique, and really not found anywhere else in the United States except maybe, you know, the country where they're from. I mean, he gets some of these things very special. He's a, the ultimate fruit collector that I've ever met, and he probably has probably the largest collection of uh, rare, unique uh, species and varieties of fruits that I ever met. So I guess so. what I want to do next is actually just share with you guys and show you guys around the place some of the more common fruits and some of the more uncommon fruits that you may not be familiar with. Uh, this episode specifically is going to be uh, interesting for people that live in the tropics. If you live in, you know, California, New York City, Wisconsin, Canada A, uh, you know, or whatever that's not a tropical location, then you will not be able to grow many of these plants. Of course, yes. You know, I visited a place in Minnesota that had a Arboretum, you know, conservatory under a glass house and they are growing many of these crops. But aside from that, you're not going to be able to grow these. So if you want to grow these, you want to move somewhere tropical like maybe South Florida or Hawaii, where you'll be able to grow, enjoy and eat some of the crops here. So anyways, uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and take you on a little tour. So the first stop on my tour today is, I wanted to say that man cannot live on food alone. He needs hydration, especially here in the tropics where it gets hot. I've been actually starting to sweat all day. I was harvesting macadamia nuts earlier. Um, man needs hydration and yes, while he does have some really awesome uh, spring water here, even a better source of water in my opinion is living water. Living water filtered up by, guess what? the coconut palm. Now the coconut palm is not a tree, it's actually a palm because it actually doesn't have wood like a tree does. It has all these little fibrous, you know, uh, strands grow growing up to basically uh, bring all the liquid and the nutrients out of the ground. So it's filtered by the palm and fills each of the coconuts 
with this delicious water that's filtered by the tree and also naturally sweetened. So, you know, he does not drink soda pop. He doesn't drink, you know, coffee or any kind of beverage out of a plastic bottle, can, or anything like that. He drinks out of nature's packaging, which is the coconut. And I need to give a disclaimer, the coconut is my favorite beverage of choice. I'd rather drink fresh coconut water before anything in a plastic bottle, can, or jar. And I want to encourage you guys to uh, drink as much coconut water as you can. It's really rich in electrolytes and also has plant cytokines, which in my opinion is anti-aging. Now, besides just harvesting the coconuts, right, nothing here is wasted. He doesn't just drink a coconut, then chuck the shell and put it in the garbage can and then get it. He's taking a landfill and it doesn't really break down, right? Everything that is on property stays on property. He's using his most valuable resource, basically, the resources he's creating on site to add back fertility because think about it. This coconut palm absorbed the nutrients and the water to make the coconuts, amazingly. And then there's nutrients in the water, also the young coconut meat, the jelly meat, which is delicious, but also in the husk, there's nutrients in the palm fronds, there's nutrients. So instead of throwing it away like many Americans throw their you know, yard waste away all the time, I wanna encourage you guys to compost it on site. He composts everything on site. So let me go ahead and show you guys the picture of what it looks like underneath these coconut palms. All right, so you might think he's a cannibal here because like what you're seeing behind me is all these drunken coconuts. Yeah, the coconuts have been drunk. <laughs> drunk last night, drunk the last night before. Gonna get drunk like I never drunk, been drunk before. That was a fraternity song. But yeah, all these uh, coconuts have been drunk and then basically he composts them underneath the coconut palm. I mean, think about it. The best food for a coconut palm are parts of the coconut palm. So he uses all the palm fronds, all the you know leftover coconut husks underneath the coconut palm to basically compost down and feed nutrients back to the coconut palm so that he doesn't have to simply buy that commercial chemical fertilizer. A matter of fact, he's all organic here and he barely sprays anything on his trees and he does not bring in any outside fertility. He has in the past only brought in basically one thing, which is one of my favorite nutrients, the rock dust. And he spread 2,000 pounds of rock dust per acre in his uh, area where he has all his fruit trees. And in the area where he has his vegetable garden, he put even higher concentrations of the rock dust. And every time I come here, I learn so much from my friend here. The thing I learned this time, because I always say, there's no such thing as too much rock dust, you can't burn. And he said, John, you can't apply too much rock dust. If you bury the plant, that's too much. <laughs> All right, so anyways, uh, if you haven't heard about rock dust yet, be sure to check my other videos. I have videos with my good friend, Don Weaver, as well as episodes that I've done on my own, uh, sharing more beneficial information on rock dust. If you don't learn anything else from this video, which there'll be a lot to learn about, you want to start adding rock dust to remineralize your soil, to create healthier plants, more bug and disease resistant plants, larger plants that not only yield more, but in my opinion, taste better. And uh, right now, I think it's time for me to drink a coconut. All right, got this baby open, man. It's time to get drunk. Mm. Wow, that's a good one. So one of the things that you may not know about if you've never drank coconut water before is that there's many flavors in coconuts. Number one, there's many varieties of coconuts. You know, fortunately enough, he has planted many dwarf varieties, so they stay short and uh, you know, he could easily harvest them instead of getting super tall. Another thing is that some coconuts are sweeter than others by nature. And if you go buy coconuts at your local Asian market or Whole Foods, you can get the Thai coconuts that look like a little yurt or teepee thing. And uh, those all tend to be the sweet Thai coconuts. I like when you harvest the coconuts, you can harvest them at pretty much any different age. If they're super young, then they don't taste so sweet, but if they get a little bit like really young, like this is a little bit more than just young, it has a really nice flavor. And if you leave them on the tree too long, 
they actually kind of get a little bit fermented and carbonated on the tree and that reminds me of drinking cream soda with over uh, two dozen coconut trees he's never going to run out of coconut water to drink and uh I'm definitely gonna plant at least two dozen dwarf coconut trees on my property one day, like he has here, and I'll never run out of coconuts either. All right, so what I wanna talk about next is what's behind me, and it's bananas. He has a whole little banana patch, and I'm confident bananas are probably one of the first things he grew because they yield relatively quickly compared to some of the other fruit trees that he's growing. While he does have many common fruits, such as the bananas and oranges and tangerines and papayas, he has a lot of other cooler stuff that I really kind of want to focus on for you guys. You know, if you guys live in the tropics, yeah, you should probably have a banana or two if you have the space for it, absolutely. But if you don't have the space for it, I would highly encourage you guys to grow unique, exotic uh, crops that literally money cannot buy. I mean, he has so many different things here that I've never ever seen in stores before and there's probably about a good quarter of a dozen different fruits that I've tried just alone on this trip and I've been here like three four different times over the last 10 years so you know there's always something new and in season and he's planted such a variety of things he always has different fruits ripening at different times of the year so that he never runs out of the fresh fruits that make up the majority of his calories. In any case, I guess uh, next I want to show you actually you guys down by some of the papaya uh, plants that he has growing. I mean, he's I mean besides just growing food, he's done an amazing job aesthetically, and that's why I like to call him a plantsman. Not only does he collect rare, unique, exotic varieties of fruits, tropical fruits, but he also has an amazingly landscape place. Now, I want you guys to consider this, you know, he's worked literally every day for the last 15 years to make this home, to put the effort in to make it look like it does. This did not happen overnight and it has taken, you know, <laughs> blood, sweat and tears probably to make this all happen. And I mean, the result shows, I mean, the proofs in the pudding, I mean, <laughs> let's go ahead and just pan across the, the way and show you guys the intense amount of ground cover that needs no mowing that also fixes nitrogen to make the soil more nutritious for the land and also the fruit trees. So I feel like I'm in a field in the sound of music, ah! but I'm not a singer. So, uh, but what we're looking at here is basically all his ground cover is all done uh, very well. Uh, most of it, although he has several different varieties of ground cover he uses, most of it is what's behind me. This is known as a perennial peanut or perennial peanut grass, even though it's not really a grass, but it's a ground cover that spreads out. Now, you know, you don't just plant perennial peanut all over. You plant one plant in a little square area, and then over time it fills in, and until it fills in, and even after it fills in, you have to continually weed. And so one of the things I wanna let you guys know is that, you know, he works at this very hard each and every day to control the weeds, and one of his, theories and things he goes by is that either you have weeds like all weeds or you have no weeds either you embrace the weeds or you don't have any weeds right and he tends not to embrace the weeds and when he sees them he pulls them I mean if you guys you guys could do it either way I mean some weeds are useful some weeds can be composted and create additional biomass he doesn't want to, have to deal with the weeds so he's you know planted areas out in the perennial peanut grass to look super nice and you know when we're walking around He'll like see weed, pick it up <laughs> and compost it, right? So that he has a really nice place. I mean, after all, you guys pick up your home, right? Inside your home, you vacuum, right? Hopefully. And you know, that's what he does here to, his, to the outside of his house. He picks up and maintains it so that it's a nice place to live like any um, person would inside their house as well. So I just wanted to go ahead and show you guys like when I'm walking around his property. I mean, this is like the ultimate park with no maintenance. I mean, look field of perennial peanut grass you could play on nitrogen fixes doesn't need to be mowed low maintenance i mean everybody in the tropics should use perennial peanut grass if they're able you know he has different ginger plants over there nice ornamentals big ornamental tree in the back i mean over on this side he has basically really nice landscaped you know like symmetrical kind of plants like the same kind of plants all over he has like poinsettias up there and 
Then you go into like a little rock garden area and the birds of paradise over there. I mean, <laughs> I wish botanical gar gardens were this cool and this well manicured and landscaped. You know, I haven't seen too many other places in the world I visited that are seriously this nice. But you know, once again, if it's your house and this is where you live, you're gonna make it nice, right? You're gonna make it nice. So I guess the next, I gotta climb up that rock wall to get to the other side to show you the papayas that I wanna share with you guys today. So what we're looking at now are many different papaya and people like to call them papaya trees and yeah, they're kind of like a tree, but once again, papayas, they're not a tree either. They're kind of like an herbaceous plant, kind of not exactly like a banana, which is not a banana tree either bit confusing but anyway just we're gonna call them papaya plants because they don't have real wood either but as you guys can see he has uh, beautiful papayas and uh, the thing I want to stop and talk about right here right now with you guys is about using all your different microclimates like and all your different areas on your property because they all offer distinct advantages and disadvantages and I want you guys to look at them as opportunities right you could think, oh man, I'm buying this property, half of it's freaking up a rock slope and I can't grow anything there because I want flat orchard land, right? Well, hey, he's used this area, added organic matter, made the land fertile, and now he's using it to his benefit to grow papayas. And I think this is one awesome looking papaya grove with all the papayas with the, uh, you know, volcanic rocks in the background. And, uh, you know, the volcanic rocks uh, and the soil probably here tend to drain well. And also the volcanic rocks tend to hold some heat. So this is probably a bit more warmer area than some other areas in the field. And uh, the other cool thing here on Maui, on where he is, uh, he's tested his papayas and they're non-GMO. So I'm glad that one of the recent things that happened in the last election here on Maui is that there's a GMO moratorium, yay, here on Maui which I believe needs to happen everywhere. And as long as the GMO companies can prove that the GMOs are safe, then they can grow it. And there's a process they need to go through. So that's fair too, you know, the GMO companies, yeah, if they want to grow it, they just need to prove it's safe. Not a big deal, right? And, uh, but if they can't, then they can't grow it. So even home gardeners, you know, are not allowed to plant GMO uh, seeds uh, knowingly, but the problem is there's potential GMO contamination. I've heard Statistics like a high percentage of papaya seeds have been cross-pollinated and now contain the GMO gene. Luckily, his papayas here grown are not contaminated. And uh, so he's able to grow GMO-free, organic, some of the best papayas. Actually, that's what I ate for breakfast today. And yeah, I would recommend the variety. And one of the cool things is he's literally traveled and seeked out um, the world uh, for different unique varieties that is to his liking. Once again, this is his home. He's not a farm, he's not selling the produce. You might think, oh man, there's so many papayas, what does he do with it, sell it? No, he eats the dogs, it's the friends, or compost it, right? And he's very particular, right? He's like a connoisseur. I know some of you guys out there watching are like wine connoisseurs, right? You guys won't buy the two buck chuck, right? You guys, ugh, that's ugh, nasty, right? And he's like that with his fruit. Like if a papaya, like, oh, it was too wet, you know, the last week, these papayas aren't, aren't the best. I'm just gonna eat something else because he has so many different options to choose from at any given meal. And he always chooses, you know, basically instinctively what he desires at that time and also what tastes good to him. And I would encourage you guys to maybe eat this way as well. So now what we're looking at is his pineapple patch. Yes, you know, you're in Hawaii, you gotta eat some pineapples. And you know, I think it's a sad state that, you know, common tropical fruits that are available at a grocery store near you, such as bananas and pineapples, are picked far too unripe and never fully develop the complex flavors that they should. In addition, the varieties of the bananas and the pineapples you're buying are very limited. For example, the bananas you're mostly buying, sold as bananas, are the Cavendish variety. Imagine if you went to the grocery store every time and you only could buy Granny Smith apples. I mean, you guys know there's Red Delicious, Fuji, Gala, and all these different kinds of apples, but imagine that apples were just the Granny Smith always, right? And to me, the Cavendish bananas are like that, are like Granny Smith apples, man. They just suck so bad and he has so many cool, unique varieties here. But the same thing with the pineapples, right? 
The cayenne pineapple, I believe, is probably one of the most uh, commonly sold, or smooth cayenne pineapple, one of the most commonly sold pineapples. You're only getting one variety, and you know everybody thinks pineapples are yellow. Well, guess what? Pineapples also come in white, and he's not wasting time with the yellow pineapples here. He's got a whole little grove here of the white sugar pines, and those guys are super delicious. So one of my favorite things to do with the white sugar pines is to uh, take them, cut them up into small bits, freeze them, and then put them through a champion juicer and make frozen pineapple ice cream. Oh, 100% frozen white sugar pine. It's the bomb. Another thing I want you guys to pay attention to, if you look very closely, you know, all around the pineapple plants, he hasn't mulched, right? He's not letting the sun hit the ground. He's not letting weeds grow up. He's got it heavily mulched with all kinds of different sticks and twigs, you know, uh, parts of trees. And this is basically to add nutrients to the garden. You know, I actually think it looks kind of cool how he's really done it here. And I know some people might say, well, John, why doesn't he chip them up? Well, number one, because he lives off the grid, doesn't want to use, bring in input such as gasoline, right? Um, he doesn't chip things up. He just puts it underneath whole. And guess what? Whether it's chipped or whole, it will always break down because natural materials will always compost. In nature, there's no such thing as waste. And here, yes, you know, things take a bit longer to degrade, but you know, the fungal action, the fungi in the soil will come up and devour all the wood material because that's their food source. And then incorporate it in to the ground in, uh, you know, in a way that is good for the ground, right? It's non-water soluble. And one of the problems that he sees is that all the water soluble chemical synthetic fertilizers that are now being applied to land that there's a lot of runoff. So this is one way that you're sure you're never gonna pollute the environment and also the plants are gonna get the nutrition they need to grow and thrive without using any chemicals or synthetic fertilizers. So what we're looking at now is an exotic fruit tree that I would recommend you guys grow if you live in the tropics. Uh, it's one of the following, it's either a, a jackfruit Champa Jack, which is related to jackfruit, or a Champa Jack, which is a cross between jackfruit and Champa Jack. He's actually gone out and gotten the best varieties that taste the best, that do well in his climate here. And uh, that's what he grows. So he has only some of the top best fruits and some of the best genetics. And by the Zeman Pink jackfruit that I ate earlier, I would definitely have to agree. Now, I want to encourage you guys, you know, once again, if you have a property, grow some unique and exotic different varieties. I mean, you could go down and buy tangerines at the store, at the farmer's market commonly, but how often do you ever see Champadac? I mean, I've never seen Champadac at a farmer's market. I have seen jackfruit, and that's more commonly available. But literally, you could grow things if you got the land, you got some space to grow things that literally money can't buy, and you can enjoy new flavors and taste sensations. One of the cool things this trip is that I got to try the Chompadac for the first time and of all things, it reminded me of eating a McDonald's Big Mac. I think it was most because the Chompadac reminded me of the Big Mac sauce and that's like the jackfruit tastes like juicy fruit gum. So all these big food companies are trying to rip off what fruit would naturally taste like, right? So I wanna encourage you guys to eat fruit instead of highly processed, refined foods. All right, so what we're looking at behind me are some old school uh, mango trees that are super tall, super huge, planted many years ago. But I'm not really interested in showing you guys the mango trees. What I am interested in showing you guys is what's growing up the mango trees literally as a wall. Now this is just not a wall of vines. This is a very special vine and the vine that I would grow if I had a hurricane fence or old school mango trees. You know, I would grow an edible vine. So the edible vine is simply called Jamaican passion fruit or Jamaican lilacoy in the islands. And uh, this passion fruit is unlike any other passion fruit you tried. Most passion fruits have that like sour taste, those, you know, purple ones or the yellow ones. These ones are actually orange and they taste sweet and fruity. One of the most delicious passion fruits that I've tasted to date. Anyways, let's go ahead and head over there and see if we can find us a ripe one. So the best place to find the passion fruit is not on the vine and climb the vine because it's probably not gonna support you. 
is to literally look on the ground. So the only thing you're competing with on the ground when they do fall to the ground is the ants. The ants love these guys because they're super sweet. They'll actually kind of burrow into them. There's uh, different fruits on the ground that have holes and they've already been eaten, but check it out here. We got two of them right here. Here's one right here. And the way I like to eat these guys, very simply just take the little uh, tip in, that's like the nipple end, I call it, because it looks like a little nipple. And we'll just uh, dig that out with your finger. And we're just gonna make a little wee hole in there. And then you're gonna put this up to your mouth and suck. Yeah, I like sucking my passion fruit. Mmm. And you get the juicy, sweet goodness out. I mean, man, I could only describe this as like drinking some kind of fruity punch drink when I was a kid. There's no bitter, sour flavor at all. Just sweet goodness from the Jamaican Lilikoi plant. I wanna encourage you guys, if you grow passion fruit or Lilikoi, grow the Jamaican kind. So what we're looking at now is basically his fruit orchard. And this is not like a standard home orchard where everything's spaced 10 feet or 20 feet and he keeps things trimmed down. You know, he just lets the trees grow as they will. In general, trees are trimmed so that they'll be easier to harvest. And what he does, he just lets nature take their course. This lets him not work as hard because he doesn't have to now uh, cut the trees and trim the trees and prune the trees and all this stuff. And he just lets them grow how they want. So uh, in that respect, he's provided a space for them to grow. So he spaced most plants out maybe 25, 30 feet between the different plants. And as you guys see, there's a great big open space here in the middle. And that's because he's basically used all his land to plant the fruit trees that he's liked. And some of the trees that he's planted in the past maybe didn't do so well, didn't yield a lot, didn't taste well. So guess what? He's cut them down and replanted new fruit trees, like there's a new one there and there. Or he's uh, uh, doing some top work, so he's actually cutting them and then grafting other varieties onto them that'll yield better and also taste better. Uh, he has so many varieties of fruit trees. I mean, he took me to tour and he was shouting out names to me and I can't even remember them all and the different trees. I know some of them. And I know one of his favorite ones is right behind me over here somewhere. It's actually called meringue. And uh, you know, I've heard that's very good. I haven't even had one to date. So one of these days I look forward to trying some meringue fruit. Yeah, look that one up, meringue fruit. I mean, there's so much different variety in the fruits. And once again, you know, he has over 300 varieties of different kinds of varieties and species of fruit. So literally he could eat different fruit every day of the year and never get bored. So now we're looking at yet another fruit tree and he has so many, I'm not gonna be able to go over all of them this trip, especially because a lot of them aren't fruiting right now. I'm kind of tending to go towards the ones that are fruiting and have some fruit on them so you guys could see what they are. Um, what we're looking at here is actually called the Mame Sapote. And if you liked like pumpkin pie, you'll love Mame Sapote because to me it tastes pretty much the same. It has that same rich, thick consistency in a fruit. It's not like watery, it's very dense and filling. Man, like one nice size of May, I'll be like totally good. And uh, it's cool to see actually the tree in its uh, budding and flowering stage right now. They just all appear. Oh look, and it's getting pollinated by the bees. All on the uh, branches of the trees. And in addition, this is a beautiful tree. You know, another thing I really want to key you guys in on is that, you know, if you haven't been to the tropics before, I encourage you guys to visit the tropics, especially if you're a fruit lover. Tropical fruits, in my opinion, are far more interesting than the temperate climate fruits. There's so many more varieties, and literally he's gotten ones from all over, you know, other tropical areas in the world, Southeast Asia and all this kind of stuff, and brought them here and are able to grow them and enjoy them in the good old USA. So what we're looking at now is the almighty long on, also known as dragon's eye fruit. One of my favorites, it's currently in season now. It's very similar uh, to the lychee if you've had those or rambutans, but personally for me, I prefer a good long end over the others. I mean, they have such a unique flavor and uh, we're gonna go ahead and try one of these guys for you. I mean, they look like little grapes, but you just don't pop these in your mouth. You need to peel off the little skin thing there. So I pop it open and it's called dragon's eye because if you pop it open, and if you guys look very carefully, look at that. Let me go ahead and give you guys a close up. 
The little fruit looks like a little dragon's eye because it's got the black seed in the middle and this is a variety that has a small seed. Mmm. Nice tropical flavor. Now, it has the consistency of a grape, but it tastes nothing like the grape. It's sweeter than a grape, more flavorful. Mmm. It's just a flavor that I love. So another unique and uncommon fruit he's growing and just yet another reason to grow your own because you could grow things that literally I've never seen in a store. It's right here and these are so good. You probably won't see them in the store because if you have a tree, you're gonna wanna eat them all yourself. Unfortunately, they're not ripe enough right now for me to eat because they need to be dark red. But this is simply known as the peanut butter fruit on previous trips, I do believe I have had it. And yes, amazingly enough, it reminds me of eating peanut butter and that's in a fruit. I mean, the diversity in fruits are simply amazing, but even more importantly, the diversity that he's growing here is even more amazing because this is just literally one homeowner's lot on his personal property that he grows just for himself. It's kind of like I have a vegetable garden and one day I'm gonna have a fruit orchard pretty much like this one to basically feed myself and my family. And I would encourage everybody out there to take responsibility to grow a good portion of the food for you know yourself as well as your family because in my opinion, the food system of today, whether it's conventional or even organic, is not growing food in the most responsible or best manner. And also, you know, when you do it yourself, it's just always gonna be better. So while he is growing mostly fruits here, he has a small vegetable garden close to the house, and also he's growing uh, a really cool vegetable here. And uh, this is one I would recommend you guys to grow in the tropics because literally it grows as a as like a tree or a shrub. I mean, this thing's towering out at like 10 feet, some of the tallest uh, katuk uh, or seropus that I've ever seen. Now, the cool thing about the katuk is, as you guys can see, it's making these beautiful little flowers and it just looks like a ornamental plant, but you could literally use this as a hedge as he has done. And the other cool thing, it makes these little fruits, uh, you know, that you can't eat, but that's not the purpose of these fruits. The fruits are for the seed but uh, it's propagated easily by cutting and that's the normal way it's propagated. And, uh, but the reason why I like this stuff is because you can harvest the leaves and eat them. Mmm. Wow. And I've so missed that flavor that I haven't had in so long. This is probably my favorite to eat leafy green in the whole world. My friend says it tastes like eating peanut butter. I don't know, maybe the peanut butter fruit probably tastes more like eating peanut butter. But it has like a nutty like um like sugar snap pea flavor like between peanut butter and sugar snap peas like it's, it's just such one of the most delicious leafy greens that you could ever grow and it'll only grow in the tropics so if you live in the tropics get some katuk i have had episodes on katuk before um you can if you live in south florida easy place to get it is called echo another place they have it in south florida west palm beach is excalibur nursery they actually have the standard uh, green variety katuk and also more rare variegated variety so yeah grow some katuk and i'll be over for lunch so i know what you guys might be thinking john if he lets his fruit trees grow like 50 feet tall or 20 feet tall however tall they get depending on the fruit tree and the variety and the cultivar and all this kind of stuff how does he harvest the fruits does he have like one of those baskets one of those things that grab it or whatever you know no what he simply does is really easy right because he's like lazy gardener or lazy plantsman is he looks down on the ground because in general, for the most part, fruit trees will drop their fruit when they're ripe. So he's, he basically takes the offering from the fruit tree that's on the ground and you have to check every day because otherwise bugs, animals, and ants will get it. And you can have the ripest stuff. Yes, of course, there are some times when he do, does harvest his fruit, but for the most part, he just lets the fruit give it up. And I like when fruit trees give it up. <laughs> like when my girlfriend gives it up too. But that's another topic. But anyways, uh, what we're looking at here are is just one of his half a dozen different nut trees. You know, you may think of Hawaii, you'll instantly think of macadamia nut, but there are other nuts that grow here as well. One of the cool ones that he's growing that I actually haven't tried fresh is the peely nut, which is a nut that's probably higher in, that is it higher in fat than even the macadamia nut. It's a, it's a really rich, really rich nut it's almost approaching oil in the amount of fat it contains because it's like mostly fat. Uh, the one we're looking at here is simply called a Malbar chestnut and you could literally look down and I don't know if I can see any nuts down here but I see all the little 
the shells had actually broken open. And here's what a nut would look like here. I have had these before, but it looks like all the Malbar chestnuts that have dropped off the tree are now sprouting and uh, growing in uh, to a new tree right there. So there's a Malbar chestnut. So, I mean, another way, that's how he does some of the plant uh, propagation is he just lets the uh, trees drop the fruit and he'll have shoots and plants come up out of the bottom that then he can harvest and uh, pot up and uh, distribute to other people. Uh, so I do want to let you guys know that if you think his place looks nice and you want to hire him or have him come over, he doesn't, he's not available for hire or anything like that. This is not his business. He does this as his, as his life. I mean, he's just simply making his home nice and growing food for him and his family, right? Something any one of us would do. So yeah, and he doesn't uh, sell the plants um, or, the, or, or the seeds either. You know, he just does this as a hobby for fun. And, um, and I'm glad that I got to come here today because it's actually a rare, rare event occasion that anybody's ever been able to film here. So now what we're looking at is an avocado tree. Yes, it's avocado, not avocado if you live in the South. But uh, this is an avocado tree, and it's one of over a dozen different trees he has. And check it out, man. Wow, that thing's heavy. Look at all these avocados on here. I mean, this is one prolific plant or tree that's growing tons of fruit. I mean, there's even more up in here. So, I mean, one of the things I want to talk about in this area of the video is that he has more than one variety of avocado tree. Obviously, he has a lot of space and acreage, and one of the things he likes to do is be able to enjoy avocados year round. Now, if he just had one variety or cultivar, you know, certain varieties fruit at certain times of the year. So you could only have avocados in the summertime, but you could never get them in the winter time because the tree doesn't produce at that time of year. And this happens in California, you know, but in a tropical climate such as Hawaii, yes, you can have avocados year round if you get the proper varieties. In general, he would recommend four varieties to get fairly good coverage, but if you wanted to get complete coverage, you know, you might need to get 10 varieties to make sure you have avocados every single month of the entire year. And of course, he has a few backup trees just in case, you know, one of the trees that produces in December doesn't produce too well. He's got another tree that might fill in because, you know, every year, every tree's a little bit different. Some years they'll produce and some years they won't. You can't control what a tree does. Maybe like your wife, you need to produce next year. <laughs> All right. So anyways, uh, let's go ahead and uh, move on and talk about some of the fertility uh, you know, that he uses here because he does not bring in any fertilizers in a box like many people may do in their orchard. So now I'm sitting underneath a mango tree and hey, there's a special song. Sitting underneath the mango tree, waiting for mangoes to drop my hands. Actually, that's not a song I made it up. But anyways, uh, the reason why I'm sitting under the tree because there's no mangoes to show you guys is because I want to show you guys what he uses for the fertility uh, for his home here. And he doesn't buy, you know, bag fertilizers and all this kind of stuff. He doesn't even pretty much make any compost to fertilize his trees. Really one of the things that is super intelligent and literally in front of our faces that nobody really does in this day and age is he said, John, the best food for trees are trees. But I would not agree that the best food for people is people, right? <laughs> I encourage everybody to eat a lot of fresh plants. Fruits and vegetables, in my opinion, are the best food for us. But the best foods for trees are trees because check it out, underneath the tree, we got all, these, all this leaf matter that's basically breaking down, composting on site to feed the tree. Because think about it, the tree made all the leaves and in nature, you know, for modeling a natural system, Trees would grow up, leaves would fall down, they would rot in place, and that is what would feed the trees. In addition, trees will like lose a branch, you know, the branch will fall, the next door neighbor tree will drop over, compost down, and that will feed the trees. I mean, I like to speed this process up by composting in a pile or tumbler, you know, because I don't have a lot of space to, you know, feed my trees, trees, I don't have any trees, so I may compost, you know, in a different area, and then bring it in to feed my trees, including really important, a fungal dominated compost made out of wood chips, which happens much faster than, you know, dropping whole tree logs like we're looking at under here. But if we pick up this log right here, I mean, this is super broken down. Wow, it just splatters into sawdust when I did that. Cause what happens is all the bacteria and the fungi and creatures will gravitate 
to the organic matter to break it down and reincorporate it into the earth. This is like a regenerative agriculture at its finest because this is duplicating a nature system to the finest. Now I do want to give a disclaimer, you know, besides creating nutrients here for the tree, how did he get started? Because if, the, if there wasn't good nutrition in the soil, how could you plant a tree so that it will survive and, and do good? So one of the first things he did when he moved onto the property was he did two things. Number one, he brought in rock dust, which I'm a, a big uh, proponent for. I believe in rock dust strongly. It's very important to remineralize the soil, not just for the trees, not just for the earth, but for the microbes. They love the trace minerals. And as well, uh, the plants need the trace minerals, which may be devoid in most soils, in my opinion. Now, the next thing he's done, he started growing nitrogen fixing trees, such as pigeon pea and garcinia, to basically pull nutrients out of the air to put it in the soil and basically build healthy soil. Then he would chop those down, drop them. And uh, when he was just starting this orchard, you know, those would provide some protection because they grow much faster than his fruit trees. He would chop them and drop them and create more fertility here, and, you know, and then finally he planted his fruit trees, chopped all the nitrogen fixers around and just now left his fruit trees. And you know, that's what he does for fertility. If trees fall, if he cuts them down, if the leaves drop, he just puts it under the trees to literally fertilize them. Of course, he also uh, composts his fruit scraps and all the fruit that comes off the tree, guess what? Gets composted and it goes underneath the tree too. So, you know, once you have a working system, that's very important, a working system, you know, it can feed itself and be self-sustaining. You don't need to be a slave to buying 10, 10, 10 fertilizer, unless, of course, you're on the mitt lighter guarding method, which actually I do not recommend and check my past videos on that one. So I know what you're thinking, you're thinking, man, John, that plant is having a bad hair day. You know, to me, this kind of looks like Medusa with all them snakes coming out the hair. But this is not a Medusa plant. This is actually a style of cactus, and it's actually known as the dragon fruit, one of my favorite fruits uh, that, I, that I get to eat sometimes. You know, a lot of varieties are not very good, especially the white varieties, you know, tend not to be so good. He's growing some of the more choice varieties here, including a Puerto Rican and a Costa Rican variety. In addition, I believe he might have, uh, you know, the yellow ones, which I tend to like more because they tend to be sweeter. And uh, you know, the cactus fruit, let me tell you guys, I mean, here on island, they sell retail for about $7 a pound. So I mean, if you could grow your own cactus fruit, do it because it's gonna save you guys a lot of money. And man, I love the diversity of fruit he's growing and also the diversity fruit that nature offers us. I mean, one of the things he's been able to do is survive on the fruits primarily, as well as some of the vegetables you know all over the years and he's healthy fit strong you know good weights good physical endurance uh, for his age and you know i believe if more people ate off their land a, a, a plant-based diet rich in fresh fruits and fresh vegetables you know uh they'd be healthier too so another thing he's growing is bamboo and you're like wait a second john you can't eat bamboo well hey pandas eat bamboo and actually yes there are certain varieties of bamboo that humans can eat you know a lot of them can be cooked and eaten, and some of them, like this variety here, can be eaten raw. Uh, this is a clumping variety of bamboo that cannot be grown in non-tropical regions. You know, in the non-tropics, they have the spreading variety that will get out of control. And, uh, you know, I really love bamboo as a plant. I mean, it makes beautiful noise when the wind's blowing. You can use this, and actually he used bamboo in the construction of his home. Um, you could use it for trellises, for supports, and actually I need some bamboo this tall to support some of my tree collards. But uh, uh, basically on the bamboo, what you do is you wanna harvest the uh, young shoots. So we got a little shoot here, and uh, basically I think just to basically break this guy off, and what you do is you uh, peel back the outer hard a uh, fibrous area and then you basically kind of like eat out the heart kind of like if you've had heart of palm and you eat the soft uh, tender part of the bamboo and so you know I mean there's really he's been growing and focusing on a lot of different uh, diverse crops whether it's bamboo fruit trees and even uh, some of the vegetables you know he grows a lot of things and I want to encourage you guys something we can learn uh, from my friend here is to grow a diversity of crops because in case you have a crop failure of one crop, you know, you're always gonna have something you able to uh, eat out of your garden. 
And this is especially important in places like Hawaii because think about it, if the ship stops coming in, right, are you guys gonna be able to eat who live on the island, right? Unless you have your own literally fruit forest like he has here, you know, you're not gonna be able to eat. So yeah, here's a little uh, soft part. Mmm, wow. It's actually kind of sweet, crunchy, neutral. Reminds me halfway between eating yacon and eating like a kohlrabi, but much more tender. Wow, super delicious. Yeah, if you can, grow some edible bamboo, such as this variety, it's super delicious. So the last thing I wanna share with you guys today is his beautiful vegetable garden. He got some collard greens here and different kales and chards. I mean, this is his summer garden. He's uh, preparing the beds and getting ready to put in his winter garden. And one of the things he does, like me, is that he puts in a lot of rock dust into his raised beds here. Uh, basically, he has raised beds. He's mounted up the dirt with no sides, so it's a raised bed. And he just grows rows, little rows and rows of crops. So here he's got the collard greens. Right here he's got some nice, delicious bok choy. Wow, came off so easily. This is so tender. Let me go ahead and taste it. My favorite part of the bok choy is not the leaves, but actually the little stalk. Wow. It's some of the best bok choy I've had in Hawaii. But yeah, super good. And uh, while he does focus on eating fruits, he does eat some vegetables when he feels like it sometimes. So I know what some of you guys might be thinking, might be thinking, John, if he just eats the uh, fruits and some vegetables, how did he get all the nutrients he needs? You know, how does he get the protein? Well, I'll let you guys know that actually the leafy greens are one of the highest protein sources on the entire planet by calorie. They have more protein than actually meat. And if you think about it, where do cows get their protein or animals get their protein, right? Horses. I mean, there's some strong creatures there. They simply eat greens, grass, and other green plant foods. And yes, there is even protein in fruit if you eat enough of it. Another thing you guys might be wondering is like, John, I didn't see any animals, you know, at his place. Does he have chickens or ducks or goats or anything to raise the fertility of his soil? Well, you know, it's his belief that those animals are not really needed and cause excess work. So he's really pragmatic, kind of like myself, <laughs> you know, to try to figure things out. Because, you know, if you have animals, you got to tend to them a lot. You got to take care of them. You got to, you know, take care of their health. You got to feed them. You got to bring in external inputs most of the time to feed them. And, you know, and the food that they're eating, right, they take out what they need and then they give you the residues to fertilize your crops. He's basically just skipping that step by using the leaves, the trees, the plant matter, and all the organic matter he's producing to put back into the land without having it go through the animal that actually takes some things out. You know, and that's just his style and how he's growing things here. And you know, I wanna let you guys know and just give you guys possibilities, right? In my videos, I share with you guys so many different ways and whether you agree with this way or not, I wanna let you guys know that this is a way that you can possibly do it if you choose to, whether you want to do it just like him or incorporate a lot of the ideas that I've shared with you guys today, or whether you want to pull out this idea and that idea, you know, that's why I make these videos for you guys to get you guys excited about growing food, uh, to get you guys excited about eating, you know, rare, unique, exotic fruits and vegetables, and to be able to live a more healthy and sustainable life. And simply, that's what my friend's doing here. And, you know, I definitely look up to him. I learn a lot every time I come in one day. I'm gonna have at least 10 acres like this, and I'm gonna try to get it as beautiful as this, but I don't know that I'm so dedicated because <laughs> he wakes up every day and uh, works on his property, and he's basically just taking care of his home and living the life that he wants to. And I wanna let everybody know and encourage everybody out there to live the life you want. You know, if you hate going to work, you know, every day to go to a job that you hate for money that you don't need to buy your groceries, right? Maybe move to Hawaii, maybe start a place like this, maybe grow your food, wake up every day, and wake up to beautiful nature, create literally paradise on earth for yourself, and grow all the food you need. And you know, that's definitely my dream that I will be doing one of these days. I hope this video inspired you guys in some way. If you liked it, please give me a thumbs up. I may come back here in future years 
and make uh, future updates and even get more information and uh, more videos about some of the exotic tropical fruits and please subscribe if you're not already. So uh, once again, hope you guys enjoyed this episode and my name is John Kohler with GrowingYourGreens.com. We'll see you next time and until then, remember, keep on growing.